Pat Mayo Hour. Welcome to the Pat Mayo Hour UFC Fight Night. Sounds like you're from London with Cody Saftik. What's happening, man? No, we're going uh, going overseas, over to the pond. So what time does this start in the morning, just so I know when like my lineups have to lock for DraftKings? It's something like prelims are like 11.45 in the morning, and then the main card starts at 4 o'clock. You know what's awesome? And someone had mentioned this to me, that it's an internet-only card. Unless you live in Canada, you watch on the Fight Network. Fight Network. Main card in the Fight Network. I think it's the first ever main card in uh, Fight Network history, so needless to say, uh, a pretty big moment for us. And we, we've carried, sorry, we've carried main cards in the past, but Anderson Silva, Michael Bisping, that's a premier card uh, on Fight Network, so uh, definitely excited for this one. Yeah, shout out to the Fantasy Sports Network, sister network, the Fight Network. So. Whoa, 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 isn't Fantasy Sports Network our sister network, Pat? Same thing. Does it go both ways? It does go both ways. We're sisters? Can't we be brothers? Why are we sisters? Sister network, that's just what you say. Is that what you say? Uh, it's industry lingo. Who coined this term, by the way? Probably a guy. Probably a guy. Yeah. I've always wondered that. Who's the guy? Who's the guy that's like, man, I started that. People just stole it from me. I, listen, if you trademarked it at the time, you'd be making lots of bucks right now, but not, the lack of foresight. He probably just didn't think it would catch on. Well, think about it, like, tail of the tape. What tape? What tail of what tape? Who came up with this? Well, tail of the tape was... I don't know. I, I, th I feel like that one makes sense. Like, when you do tail of the tape, back in, like, the 1920s, well, they actually well, had physical tape that they measured you with. <laughs> it was the tail of the tape. This was, oh, 68-inch reach, huh? Well, just stick out your arm, let me measure it for you. Sure. Now get in the ring, and we're going to do this with the talkies. <laughs> All right, so UFC Fight Night 84, UFC London uh, is what we're calling it here. DraftKings is the only... DFS MMA provider counter move is finito. DraftKings bought it out, so you want to do all your daily fantasy MMA playing on DraftKings right now. Uh, $50,000 salary cap. You pick five fighters. Uh, we're going to break it down a little bit more now. We're going to switch between a cash game lineup when we get to the end and talk about the picks. That is your safe. You're doing 50-50s. You're doing double ups as opposed to a GPP lineup or a tournament lineup uh, where you're just trying to win. Oh, yeah. You you need to have the highest score. Taking risks. Only the top 15, top 10%, top 20% of the field actually pay, <sighs> but it's where you can enter a $3 tournament and win like three grand. So, it's a bit of a different situation, so you want to take a few more risks and have guys that maybe, you know, yeah, you're going to have to take an upset in there. Absolutely. Just to differentiate your team just a little bit. So let's start with the main event, Anderson Silva versus Michael Bisbing. DK prices are 10-8 and 8-6. Bisbing is a heavy, heavy underdog here, plus 250. He's British, isn't he? Yes, and undefeated in Britain as well, or the United Kingdom. Has he ever fought Anderson Silva in Britain? <laughs> Sadly, no. So he might not stay undefeated for long, is what you're saying. Yeah, and Anderson Silva's pretty much, I, I'm pretty sure he's undefeated in England as well. So I He's mean, undefeated this, most places, this, I feel. This, this moniker is really just uh, for giggles. So is Anderson Silva still like one of the pound-for-pound pound guys in the world? Or no. is he sort of past his prime now? Yeah, not only is he past his prime, but uh, 40 years old. So that's, you know, a little bad sign. And then it's like, oh, man, he lost his title and lost two huge profile fights to Chris Weidman. It's like, oh, and, and then he snapped his leg in half. It was like, oh, and, and then he tested positive for steroids. So it's like when uh, when things go wrong, they really go wrong, Pat. And uh, so in this case, uh, it's not just raining. It's pouring for poor Anderson Silva. So if you're pro Silva, the, the thought process is, yeah, he's going downhill. But, but Bisping's arguably kind of trending downwards himself. And he's not a prime Anderson Silva, but he's still good enough to beat Bisping. If you're pro Bisping camp, it's like, yeah, this guy's sliding downhill. Now's the time to take advantage, and uh, I can certainly see it. The amount of value on DraftKings for Anderson Silva, I cannot justify that. So 10-8 is too expensive. That is very expensive. 10-8 is you need to knock out Michael Bisping in the first and second round. Is that possible? Sure, it's possible. Is it probable? Probably not probable. More likely a five-round decision. So if you're pro Michael Bisping, then it's going to help to get five rounds of points. If you're not on team Michael Bisping, it's still not a terrible idea to maybe take him because he's so cheap. If you can get five rounds of play out of him and he can get 50, 60 points... It's not going to win a GPP game, but it's going to win a cash game if you want to be safe. Yeah, and in, if you do take him at $8,600, I assume, I haven't looked at your lineup yet, that it does allow you to afford some of the better, more expensive players. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, there, there's one player uh, in particular, Tom Breeze. He's so expensive that you really need to make the conscious decision. Do I go after Tom Breeze and I know I'm going to get that guaranteed 100 points, but I have to sacrifice the rest of my lineup? Because, yeah, I can guarantee you 100 points out of him. But if you're going to guarantee yourself 100 points and you're going to take some people that do you no good, you know, you're going to handicap yourself. If you avoid Tom Breeze and you can fit a bunch of mediocre players that are going to get 65, 75, 85 points, well, then maybe that's the better way to go, so to speak. So there's definitely different ways to play the lineup. For those new to the show, everyone, well, I mean, for those new to the show wouldn't know this, but the people that watch know that I'm not a big MMA guy, but I am a big daily fantasy guy. You're the MMA expert telling me 
what I need to know, the teams that I need to construct, but I'm not familiar with these names. And this one's kind of a tough one. I just did a quick breeze. So every time that I mispronounce a name, you're going to hear, <laughs> and then I hang my head in great shame. <laughs> But so let's get to this Tom Breeze fight. He's 11 4 on DraftKings, minus 1,000 on the betting line. He's taking on a guy named Kita Nakamura. Yeah, Kita Nakamura. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty, pretty close. Pretty close. It's it's not right though. It's, it's an X. The mispronunciation <laughs> goes on the ticker. <laughs> there it is. So you think that Breeze is just this is a shoe in? Well, I mean, the fact that they got a 10-1, I mean, it seems that everybody thinks it's a shoe in But if I was the odds maker, I'd have it 15-1. to <laughs> Like, I, I really don't see any path to victory here for Nakamura other than if Tom Breeze was to slip on a banana peel, peel and land on his head or something now, like that. Now, let me ask you, is this Mario Kart UFC? Because if that's the case, that's, that's a distinct possibility. Yeah, exactly. Like an oil <laughs> slick and I spin out, and I'm like, oh, no. Unfortunately, Tom Breeze would probably just, like, spin out and then just get back in the lead here. I mean, uh, it's no knock against Nakamura, but Nakamura, he fought in the UFC back in 2007. Fought three times, lost all three of them. Basically gets released from the UFC, and that was 155 pounds. Gets released from the UFC, and then now he goes back on the Japanese regional scene. He, he wins a couple fights. He loses a couple fights. Eh, he's not going to work his way back up to the UFC. Now UFC goes to Japan. They need a guy. Kaido Nakamura, well, he's got a decent run. He's, he's a veteran. Uh, let's bring him in and, and give him a guy that we think he's going to lose. A guy to. that's not going to embarrass the UFC by fighting. Exactly. So he fights a guy named Jingliang Li out of China, right? Okay. And, and on the Japanese card. And Jingliang Li smokes him in round one. And then Jingliang Li smokes him in round two. And then midway through round three, it's like a, an epic letdown. This little Nakamura, he botches a takedown attempt, slips out the back door with a switch, t- jumps on this guy's back and chokes him out. It's like, oh, my God, what a fluke win. But you fluked win a guy like uh, Jing Liang Li. Hey, it's a win. A win's a win. Now you're getting booked against Tom Breeze. Tom Breeze is not only Nakamura's now a welterweight, but he was a lightweight. Tom Breeze is six foot three. He's a gigantic 170 pound fighter. He's great on the ground. His boxing skills is, is, is great. If the fight stays standing, he's going to knock him out. If the fight hits the ground, he's probably going to pound him out or submit him. I don't know if he'll submit him or if he'll knock him out, but he is going to finish him. I'm very confident in the first round. If not in the first round, surely in the second round. And if not in the second round, then I, I don't know. I don't know. But I, I really <laughs> think that he's going to come in there and just have a, a big performance. And you know, when you're a 10-to-1 favorite, Tom Breeze is from England, trains out of Montreal with George St. Pierre now, but he's from England, hometown crowd, need a big performance. You're a 10-to-1 favorite, young kid. What do you do? You go in there and you smoke this guy the way you know that you should. So, so it almost seems to me where Bisbing's the underdog in the Anderson Silva fight. He's like the hometown British guy. Guy, probably going to lose. They gave this guy, this Breeze guy, a soft opponent so he can go out there and win, get the crowd all fired up. Well, so th- as the story goes, George St. Pierre was getting ready to defend his title against Carlos Condit. So the TriStar camp out of Montreal, what, they were like, like... eight years ago? Well, it would have been... Two years ago? Four years ago. And so they're like, we need guys that can mimic Carlos Condit. We need big tall, lanky welterweights with awesome striking, good ground game. And then when they found a guy named Brandon Thatch, and they found this Tom Breeze kid. After the fight, Brandon Thatch went back to Colorado, and he's had an okay career. Tom Breeze has stayed in Montreal. He's undefeated, and he's looked phenomenal. I think the real word on this guy is he's the next big thing. He's going to be something special. And if you're the UFC, you're like, okay, we got guys like Faraz Zahabi in the TriStar Gym telling us how special he is. We've seen from his performances in the UFC, he's 2-0. and He's decimated both guys, you know, in spectacular fashion. He looks real, the real deal. He's great size. He's young kid. He's marketable. He's good looking. He's got everything going for you. And he's European, which is huge because you got a North American guy. He's just another dime a dozen American guy out of Iowa. So right? it's almost like how George St. Pierre was able to corner the Canadian market because he was Canadian. Yeah, yeah. They're going to Croatia and they don't have any Croatian fighters. So they have to sign these Croatian guys. If you were the only Croatian fighter on the roster and you had a big name, you're a shoe in for these European cards. If you're Australian and you're a big name, you're a shoe in for those Australian cards. It's just the way it works. They need these guys. So Tom Breeze is going to be a huge star, especially in Europe. So it's like, okay, let's let him go in there and let's blast Nakamura in one round. Everyone, at the end of the night, people are going to say, oh man, he killed him. Yeah, yeah, that Bisbing Anderson Silva fight. Oh, that was fun. Oh, you know, Bisbing's what, 37 and, you know, Anderson's 40. Yeah, but, but the future, oh, that Tom Breeze, that's going to be a part of the storyline as well. So big expectations from this guy, and I got big expectations from him too. And clearly DraftKings does as well, because 11 4, that's it very might expensive. Be, it might be the most expensive person I can see, I, I've ever seen. I've never, even Ronda Rousey doesn't ever get that high, and they were sh- assuring first round finishes. Yeah, and she was, yeah, she would only be like 10 8, 11 yeah, 1. This is the most expensive I've seen. Very but expensive. Is there any lineup that you will build this week that doesn't have Tom Breeze on it? 
yeah, so for my cash game lineup, I decided to go for Tom uh, without Tom Breeze because when you're looking for GPP, we as we talked about, we need those finishes. So when I take Tom Breeze, I look at the rest of the card. It's like, well, I can take some risk and find some other finishes. If I take him in the cash game, well, then the rest of my lineup are guys that I might not even think they might not even win, right? And if I don't even have confidence in these guys to just get the decision win, there's not really cash game lineup because I'm once again taking risk. So I was able to build a, a team without Tom Breeze. I started with him, but when I thought about it, it's like, you know what? Yeah, I like we'll, we'll a guy. Look at your cash game. Uh, cash yeah, okay. game team uh, at the end here. We'll, we'll reveal them both at the same time. Sure. I want to talk about Brad Pickett for a second. He's $9,000. I don't see him. I see him on your GPP team, which means that you think he has an actual chance of beating friend Francisco Rivera. Oh, yeah. 10-4. 10-4. Both of these guys throw hot fire, Pat. Oh, that's good. 135-pound guys, and they like to throw. People always say Brad Pickett's chinny because it's not that he gets knocked out. He has been knocked out. It's not that he always gets knocked out. It's that he gets hit with shots and he does the stanky leg. And it's just like, oh, no, he might be going down. Francisco Rivera, he comes in with hot fire and he just throws bombs until he knocks you out. But he's susceptible in a couple areas. Most notably, you can take him down. If you can take him down, his grappling's not great. And because he swings such wild bombs, I mean, you, there's a chance that you can swing a wild bomb back at him and hit him. And his last fight against John Lineker, these guys went at it. But where he knew, I'm bigger than this guy, I got a longer reach than this guy, I'm better on the ground than this guy, I got more power than this guy, arguably more power, but almost as much power, he just decided to brawl. He's a 33-year-old fighter. His wins in the UFC are over really low-caliber guys, and his losses in the UFC are to the upper echelon guys. Brad Pickett, 37 years old, he's an English fighter, but... He, I don't want to say that it's starting, the game's starting to pass him by a little bit, but he has not looked good in a number of years. But in his last fight against Thomas Almeida, he starts well, and then he gets hit by a flying knee in the second round that completely knocks him out. What I see here, though, is he has a speed advantage, he has a wrestling advantage, he arguably has a grappling advantage. Because, jo because uh, Francisco Rivera has such low ring IQ, <laughs> I think Brad Pickett could lull him into the pr exchanges that he wants. Lull him into move forward and get a takedown. He's in front of his own hometown crowd, He's either going to knock this guy or submit him, and even if he can just squeak out two decisions, maybe he's going to get this hometown cooking decision. Great value on him if you like Brad Pickett. And uh, for a plus-185 underdog, he really does have a chance of winning, so I, I don't mind playing it. Yeah, $9,000. Is there any other quick finishes besides Breeze that you see on the card? Yeah, there's a kid on the card, uh, almighty Arnold Allen. Uh, Arnold Allen! 22 years Arnold. old. Once again, another English fighter, as uh, you'll see a reoccurring theme on this card. But Arnold Allen's a, as a kid that if you uh, ever saw him fight back in the regional scene in Europe back in the day, he, the sky's the limit for him. I, I always compare him to, to Sage Northcutt because I think this is the guy that they should have been marketing, this young, good-looking, upstart, sky's the limit for this kid. He does already have a loss on his record, which is maybe why they didn't pursue marketing him as much, but but that loss builds you as a fighter. And in his last fight against Alan Omer, Alan Omer's a gangster. I mean, this guy has very good grappling credentials, good striking credentials, put in a really solid camp, and has never looked a fool in any of his fights. And Arnold Allen was able to go in there, young kid, was able to grind him, grind him, grind him, grind him, and in the third round submits this guy. He's always getting better. He's had a decent enough layoff that I know he's going to have improved skill set. And unfortunately, he's just way bigger than Yautzen Meza. Yautzen Meza is a guy that's you know made a career at 135 as well he's up to 145 here and i really do like yao Meza. but when people put pressure on him he melts almost every time and arnold allen's the kind of kid that at 22 years old you're full of energy you're the best shape of your life you can go cardio for days you can lift weights at the gym and you know life hasn't really gotten the way 35 year old yao Meza, life's kind of gotten the way and i think arnold allen goes in there and smashes him he's a little bit expensive but you can actually play him on both teams yeah i, I see he made both your gpp and cash team i'd like to worry the way you talk about this breeze guy oh, i yeah. feel like i need to find a way to get him onto my cash team Paul Shaughnessy actually found a way to have him on the cash. Well, team how do you do that? Because he likes Michael Bisbing and a fighter by the name of Talis Ladies. He likes both. Talis Ladies taking on J Guard. <laughs> Gay Guard Musasi. Gay so you're guard. already on a. <laughs> <laughs> Um, he, as I said, great shape for me. These guys are both dogs with a chance. And if you like both of them in particular, then you can afford whatever else you want. I don't like both of them, but. I think one of them will win. Ladies has a chance of winning. Bisbing has a chance of winning. Well, you know, it, but okay, both okay, of them winning—that's okay, well, a stretch. Well, here's the thing, then. If you like, who are your two biggest locks on the card? Throw out betting odds. Throw out pricing. Throw out all that. It sounds like Allen and Breeze are the two guys that you think are just going to win and win by knockout. Yes, and then there's Rustam Habalov. I'm very confident that he gets the win, but it's probably going to be a boring decision. So it's not. So then you probably should. Yeah, but then that that does that does mean nothing. Well, it, it does in the for, sense that... He's $10,700. If I take him on my team and I'm spending that much on a guy, I want a quick finish. I really do. I know that's... In a GPP, you do. 
in anything I do, yeah. even for a cash game. Like, if you can tell me that Allen and Breeze are both going to get quick finishes and they're both going to score over 100 points, I can take the risk on a coin flip. If you think that one of these two scrubs is going to win, I only need one of them to win now. Because if I score over, let's say, 350 points, I'm going to win my cash game anyway. Yeah. So if you can give me... 220 off the top with these two guys and you give me a coin flip between two cheap guys so I can afford them, all I need to do is hit on that last guy Fair and I'm enough. fine. But now let's say you take Talos Lazy and you take Michael Bisping. Arnold, and they both lose. Arnold, Arnold Allen goes, yeah, imagine that. They both lose. And is it possible? Yeah, one of them's like a two and a half to one <laughs> underdog and the other one's a two to one underdog. It's riskier. It, it, it's riskier. And if you're confident that, you know what, I think both those guys go in there and you get the win. When I look at a guy like Rustam Hobolov, it's like, okay, does he go out there and finish? No, nah, not likely. Does he go out there, score some takedowns, you know, score some significant strikes, get his win bonus because he's going to win the fight? Eh, maybe I can scrap up 65 points. Well, that's not going to win me a GPP. But if I'm playing cash game, I'll take that 65 points over your Michael Bisbee gets knocked down in the first round or over your Talus ladies gets knocked down in the first it round. It is, but the price difference. But the thing is, he's 10-7. Like, yes. we're talking about guys that are 8600 versus guys that are $2,000 more. Like, when I'm paying an extra two grand for a guy, I want to finish. I yeah. want 100 points. I don't want 50. If Fair I enough. can spend 8600 to get possibly 45 points, the points per dollar that I'm getting on the cheap, crappy guys, I mean, it's significantly more than I'm getting on the super expensive guy. Yeah, it's true. So... Those two, Allen and Breeze, quick finish guys. Is there any other potential quick finish guy on this card? You could potentially go for a guy like Daniel Milanchuk. Uh, a little bit risky only because the, uh, his opponent is undefeated, and Daniel Milanchuk has had some stinker performances in the past. But in his last fight, he got a knockout first round 40 seconds in. He's a big body, he trains out of Poland, and he's put on a very solid fight camp for this one. When you look at uh, Yargas Danho, he's coming out of, he's actually a Syrian fighter. I'm so glad that you brought up the name and I did not have to yeah, say I didn't that. think you were going to take a shot. <laughs> I, I was not going to take a <laughs> shot. I was just going to avoid yeah, that fight yeah, completely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, he's a Syrian fighter, actually, that trains out of Germany now, and he's like, like almost 300 pounds. His last fight was 260, but I've seen him hover around that 280, 290 limit. Can you? What's the max you can fight at? 265. So he has to he has to cut the to come down to 265. But he usually fights little guys, and you know he beats these little guys because he's so much bigger than them. But he has moments in these fights where it's like, geez, he's getting moved around. <laughs> geez, he's for a guy that, that is that big, he's not really swarming them. But geez, he's getting hit a lot. And against these little guys, it doesn't matter. He's got some decent wins. He beat Marcus Vanton, who's a 205er, and he's such a large man. Daniel Malanchuk, he's fought in the UFC multiple times now. He's got the jitters, octagon jitters, out of the way. Big show experience, he's got that now. Striking, he comes from a striking background, but because he always gets taken down, he's working a lot on the takedowns. He comes out of a good camp out of a Poland. He's trained stateside over San Jose with guys like Cain Velasquez and Daniel Cormier. He's putting in the hard work. Yargis Dano, meanwhile, I mean... I'm not going to call him a Syrian refugee or anything like that, but, I mean, like, he's had a tough life, and now he relocates to Germany. He's got a really, really small little camp in Germany. How many people in this – how many people do we work? 60, 70? How many of those people are 300 pounds? Like Two? Yeah, but, but <laughs> how many people of them are 150 pounds? Most of them, right? So this guy doesn't really have the training partners to be there. Where I know Danny Omelanchuk trains with big guys like Yang Blankowitz, Marcin Tabor. So when he's training for his fight, they can put some dummy up next to him that basically mirrors this guy – and he can do his training that way, where the other way around just doesn't happen. Yeah, well, uh, the Kimbo Slice fight from the weekend, right? We'll talk about that in a second, too. <laughs> he, says, he says afterwards, he's like, man, so, uh, there's, why are you so tired? You didn't train Kimbo? He's like, no, it's just, I train with these little guys. So when I had to grapple with a guy my own size, it completely zapped all my energy. And that's a real thing. And when I look at Danny Omelanchuk, it's like, ah, this guy, this guy rolls Marcin Tavora and Jan Blankowitz. Those are big guys. Like, he's getting the experience in. When I look at Dan Ho, it's like, hmm. He's not really rolling big guys. And I think in the first round, Dan Ho might be good. In the second round, Dan Ho will be a little bit tired. And whereas Danny Ohms will start tiring a little bit too, this is his fifth fight in the UFC. He's been there. He's lost decisions. He's won decisions. You know, he, he's been into the fire before. He kind of got a better understanding of it. The only reason I think that this is a, an opportunity for a quick finish or a finish, as you mentioned, is that Danny has got good value on him. And he's such a big dude as a heavyweight that that's what happens in these situations. Dan Ho's untested. 6-0. and oh, That's green. That's green, and he just has not been tested. Danny might be able to go in there and just like his last fight against Chris De La Roca, completely starts this guy in a minute. Hmm. 
Could happen. All right. Well, I mean, well, let's get to your lineups then. So, Absolutely. Uh, we're going to separate this between cash games and GPPs on DraftKings for Fight Night London or Fight Night 84, whatever people are. What is it? Or Fight Night Silva Bisbing. Well, people just lose track of the number so easy because the UFC is like, oh, we canceled this event. Oh, we shift this. Uh, that's not a fight night. It's a Fox card. <laughs> but that's not a Fox card. It's a fight. It's like, oh, man, I can't even keep up. So, so UFC like, London. UFC London. Let's call it UFC London. But it is technically 84. So yes. UFC London cash game. Let's hear it. Okay, <laughs> UFC London cash game. Starting off with Arlen Allen, 10,900. Because we opted not to go Breeze, we can save the $500. We still need an expensive player. We still need someone who's going to get points for our team. So go with Arnold Allen. Rustam Hobbelov, 10,700. You make a great point in that if he's not going to get a finish, why pay the 10,700? Uh, 10, it's not that he's not going to get the finish. It's just that I don't really see it happening because Norman Park's a very durable guy. But if you look at Hobbelov, he's lost his last two fights to two of the absolute division's elite in Adriano Martins and Benson Henderson. Then he took a full year off with visa issues. He could not get a visa. couldn't travel anywhere to fight. So we haven't seen him in a year. I'm sure he's made improvements. He is a good striker. He is a much better grappler. It's just Park has ways of surviving. So he might score well, and he's very safe in my opinion. That's the reason I'd like to go with him. Then moving on, we got Christoph Jotko, 10,100. Once again, this guy's as safe as safe can be, I think. I think he completely runs shop on Brad Morris. The problem is, is that he doesn't really have finishing capabilities. he get a guy in bad position, and he'll hit them, but he's not really reining it down. When he wins fights, he wins decisions. And I think he's going to win the decision, okay, well, let, but it'll be a safe decision. Let me ask you this then. Yeah. So he comes in at $10,100. In order to afford Breeze, I would have to drop down to another level. Is there anyone $1,000 cheaper, or sorry, $1,200 cheaper, $1,300 cheaper, you wouldn't mind putting on this cash game, taking him out and putting Breeze in? $1,300 cheaper so we're, than, we're looking, than Jotka. We're looking at sub $9,000. Below 9000 Is there anyone? Below the nine thousand. Below yeah, 9, if you 000. want, because if you want to go like a Talis ladies, like Paul was able to do, if you want to go Bisbing and Talis ladies, then you can save that money. When I look at the guys that are below uh, the nine thousand mark, a lot of people like this Marlon Vera, Cheeto Vera. He's out of Greg Jackson's gym. Yeah. A lot of people are high on him. Davy Grant is opponent, another British fighter, hasn't fought in two years and is just riddled with injuries. Torres meniscus last year, has not fought in over two years. How big are these guys? One thirty-five. One thirty-five. So if speed would come into it, wouldn't it? If you blew your me. Ab absolutely. And, and, and Davy Grant, I'm surprised he can still make 35 because he is gigantic. But as a result, you got to cut a lot of weight. And when you're cutting weight, you need to run. And when you run, you need your meniscus, <laughs> which he does not have. So I, I, he might have a terrible weight cut. And for that reason, a lot of people are on Cheeto Vera. A lot of people like Cheeto Vera. I just personally don't. But you can most definitely fit him on. And if you can afford a Tom Breeze regardless, then if Cheeto Guevara gets you 30 I, points, I, I, I think that's probably good. I, I think that's exactly enough to drop down from Jot Jotko. Yeah, Christoph Jotko. So you take out his 10,100. You drop down to Vera at 8,900. You can then afford Breeze. Does that even work in that spot? I think I'm, so. I'm not even going to lie. If you ask me straight no, up. No, it doesn't even work. That is, I'm. It, keep, yeah. but keep, keep Jotko, drop Hobolov because Jotko is going to have a very similar performance. He's just, he's going to own him for three rounds. It's likely going to go the three rounds. You're probably going to get 60, 70 well, points out of him. Well, if you drop Kavalov off this team and you upgrade to Breeze, you'd have to drop from uh, your boy was it Am Amalinik? Yeah, to Chito. Yeah, or ladies. <laughs> you'd have to go down to Talos ladies. Yeah. yeah. You could definitely make it work. All right. You know, I, I'm going to tinker around with some of those lineups. Yeah, absolutely. Cash game was, but this is the cash game lineup that you really like. Yeah, I like it just because when I look and I say, okay, Arnold Allen, what are his what are his chances of losing? Nah, I think he beats you out to Mates fairly handily. Okay, Habalov, what are his chances of losing? Against Norman Park? Nah, I don't really don't think that's going to happen. Okay, Christoph Jocko, what are his chances of losing? Jocko, ah, geez, he's got way more reach. Way, he's actually better standing. His wrestling's far improved. 26 years old, always making improvements. Yeah, he's a pretty safe guy. Daniel Malanchuk, well, he's a heavyweight, so there is some risk there, but... I just think big show experience, all the things we talked about, I think he's going to have a better performance. I think he's going to get the win. And then finishing up with Michael Bisping, that is a bit of a risk. But because it's five rounds, I'm playing a cash game. It's safe. I, I don't need – other people are going to try to get Tebow Gowdy. And maybe Tebow Gowdy gets that first-round knockout and beats you. Or Tebow Gowdy got hand surgery three weeks ago, and he doesn't even throw the hand. That's an unpredictable thing. So for that reason, Michael Bisping, uh, regardless of that, I personally think he's going to lose. I think for $8,600, I can justify it. Gowdy made your GPP team, though. Yeah, because uh, if his hand's all the way healed, he's good to go. 
So he's on there. He's 9,900. You have Pickett on there at 9,000. And this team does have both Breeze and Allen on it because you have Chris Dempsey, who we haven't even talked about. Yeah, Chris Dempsey, an American guy. Uh, you, you get the impression he's getting fed to the Wolves because he's like a 3-1 to one underdog, A. And B, he's from Pittsburgh, and they've sent him to England to fight. But they, ha- they were in Pittsburgh last week. Like, why, why did they just put him on the hometown show? Nope, nope, sending you overseas. His, his biggest issue is he's 1-2 uh, and two in the UFC. In both of his losses, he got knocked out in the first round, which would suggest you probably want to take Ask on your team. But he's got this tendency, Pat, right? He debuted in the UFC on two weeks' notice at 205 pounds. He got knocked out. And then in his second fight in the UFC, full camp, and he drops 20 pounds of weight, fights at 185, good performance for him, gets the win. His next fight goes back up to 205 on two weeks' notice and gets knocked out. Okay, so clearly the issue is don't go to 205. Stop taking fights on two weeks' notice. So here he gets a full camp. He's at 185 pounds. And this guy's two-time NCAA uh, All-American. Wrestler? Wrestler. You always like the wrestlers. Division sc- Division two school, but this boy knows how to wrestle. And when I compare that to Scott Askham, no disrespect to English fighters, but they've always had an issue with their wrestling. With their wrestling. wrestling defense, always been an issue for them. And people are really quick to point out, hey, Michael Bisbee can wrestle. Yeah, he trains in California. Well, Brad Pickett can wrestle. Yeah, he trains in Florida. Those guys have moved to the States and learned how to wrestle. When I look at this particular case, it's like Chris Dempsey knows how to wrestle. Scott Askham doesn't know how to wrestle. Chris Dempsey's very herky-jerky because if you were, when he wrestled in college, 285 pounds, right? 285? 285. And now he fights at 185, right? So he's big guy. So he was on steroids. No, he's a big fatty. Okay. But let me ask you this. If you were 285 pounds and a good athlete in college and you wrestle, something's wrong because you should be playing football. Right? That's like, true. <laughs> but the fact that you're not playing football and that you're wrestling at Division two school means you weren't good enough to play football. I don't know. All I'm saying is he's very herky-jerky. He's not very athletic, but he's tenacious. And if he can eat a couple of the punches from Askham and he can close that pocket, he can grind him the same way he grinded Eddie Gordon, and that is supreme value for him. So I think Dempsey could have a good performance, and on a GPP, I am willing to take that risk. Yeah, because in the GPP, again, you need to shoot for upside. I mean, there's no difference between if you play in a tournament with 100 people, there's no difference between coming 35th or 100th. Mm-hmm. You don't win. You're trying to come first, second, or third. Here. Absolutely. And, and speaking of that, when you got when you look at Askham, it's like okay, Askham does have some knockout power, and he's the English guy, and they're he's a three to one favorite, and they're bringing in this American schlub, and this American <laughs> schlub got knocked out in 30 seconds in his last fight. Uh, I definitely want Scott Askham. So I would assume Askham is going to be a high played player. I don't see him getting this win. Dempsey's going to be a low played guy. So if you got Dempsey and he gets the win, not only are you scoring some good points there, everyone else is losing points too. That's just that's a plus. I like it. All right, that's enough of this card for UFC London. There are a few things I did want to talk to you about. Absolutely. So I've been going around the office, and there's been a lot of points of contention here. I th- I feel like you have a good middle ground of you're a MMA purist. You watch it from the lowest levels to the highest levels. You know, I could walk in, you're watching like the weirdest stuff going on on oh, like, yeah. Native Reserves in California. Tachi Palace. Yeah, sure, whatever it is. Like, you're into everything, and I'm not. I barely watch any of this. And I did turn into the Kimbo match, though. Oh, good times. And a lot of people are talking about, like, that's a disgrace to the sport, all this stuff. And for me, thinking about it, I'm like, well, I watched it. Yeah. I thought it was hilarious. Yeah. Like, it, I was at a bar. I turned it on. I was like, normally, like, if MMA is on in a bar, yeah, maybe I'll watch it. Maybe I'll. Like, people stopped and watched this. Yeah. So, it was it a good thing or a bad thing? Like, was it embarrassing? Is it a black eye for the sport? Like, no one actually got hurt. I could see if, like, someone actually got hurt. Well, the one guy almost died. Like, oh, yeah. What? A, so, he actually attack? got hurt. <laughs> no, no one seems to care. His kidneys failed. If he did die, then he'd oh, have yeah, a problem. Yeah. But, and apparently but, close, too. But he, but he didn't, so <laughs> apparently it was fine. What was your take on the entire thing? Would you run it back again with similar people involved? Yeah, I would. And I know I'm going to take some flack for saying this because I don't, I don't see it as a black eye for the sport. When I went online, everyone was really trashing it. This is the worst fight I've ever seen. This is a disgrace. This just set the, the sport back, this and that. At the end of the day, we, we're, a, we're an entertainment business. We're a business. And like every sport, you need eyeballs on your product. If we don't got eyeballs on the product because people don't think it's a great sport, then that's fine. If these idiots want to go watch this, you know, two guys from the, the streets of Miami fight for the King of the Streets title and you two million people tune in to watch it, well, then that's good for me. And I I liken to this. Uh, let's say we're at a David Buster's or some some sports bar, and you've got a hundred people in the sports bar with you, 
and you say, okay, guys, we're putting on Floyd Mayweather versus Manny Pacquiao, the creme de la creme. Everybody watches it, and they're bored, and they're texting on their phones, and they leave the night thinking, I didn't really have a good time tonight. Next time you say, hey, do you want to go watch the big boxing nope. match? Not really. I didn't really have a good time. This, you put the same 100 people in a bar. It's like, oh, shit. Oh, no. Oh, no. He's not going to. Oh, no. It's just, it was it was fascinating. It was appealing. And for as long as it lasted. It was a spectacle. I don't think yes. you could run it back all the time because it would lose that cachet. And this is, this is the magic of a fight like that. 50 people in that bar are thinking to themselves, you can beat that guy. <laughs> you, you don't watch a good high-level fight and think that. You think, I don't even know what's going on right now. They're moving at too quick of a pace. This, it's like, man, I'd beat that guy. Well, that was 20. me. That was me. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so for that reason, I know it sounds like a joke. I know it sounds like, oh, your sport's a joke. No, because there's a lot of good fights. Linton Vassell versus Emmanuel Newton, that was on that same main card. Brilliant fight. The Emmanuel Sanchez-Daniel Pineda fight, brilliant fight. It wasn't a whole card of joke. It just had a couple jokes on it. And, and those were the people that drew the people in to watch the yeah, entire card. Yeah, great. Two million viewers. <laughs> Let's do that all the time. So, the, like, the, the reason that I really noticed it, and I was just like, yeah, what's going on? Because, like, in my Twitter feed, there are certain things that are kind of always there. I follow a lot of people that cover golf. Some yeah. people are just talking about golf all the time. People are talking about football all the time. People are talking about movies all the time. My entire timeline lit up with MMA. I was like, what is going on here? Yeah. Like, I, I need to go watch this. Everyone was watching it, and that just never happens. No, it was— like, it even was... with your high-end UFC fights, people don't watch it like that. Well, the the fact is that a, like a casual fan would be able to be like, yeah, I know, I know who Kimbo. I is. know Kimbo. I it's, remember him from the internet. Yeah, it's just like, well, do you know who George Masvidal is? Ken, like Ken Shamrock. Who's yeah, well, world's people, most dangerous man, Ken Shamrock. Uh, buddy, that guy can take a chair shot like <laughs> none other. Listen, I wouldn't want to get into the fake octagon and have him put me in the ankle lock. Well, I'll That'd tell be you what. no good for me. I'll tell you what. He uh, he had a legendary feud with Steve Blackman, who Steve I, still, Blackman. I still think could kick some ass right now. Is Dan Severn still around? He's apparently fighting Ken Shamrock in like a month. I'm there. Right. I'm in. I'm in. It's a, it's a whole card that they got going on with different types of ba fights on it, right? So you've got a pro wrestling match on the card. So we'll start with MMA. you got a pro MMA match between Ken Shamrock and Dan Severn. Then you got a pro wrestling match between... Kurt Angle and Rey Mysterio Jr. What? Yeah, hopefully he doesn't kill Kurt Angle, by the way. <laughs> uh, then you got a grappling match between Michael Bisbing, who's on this card, and Chael Sonnen, the ESPN broadcaster. And then, to top it all off, you got pound for pound, one of the greatest boxers in the history of the planet, Roy Jones Jr., is taking on a fan. You how, get, how, you old is, how old is Roy Jones Jr.? <laughs> oh, like 46. What, what is this card? It doesn't even really have a name. It's just called like you, like you are sports. Uh, it's like a it's like a entertainment company is basically putting on like a one night. It's like a spectacle. It's a spectacle pay per view, and they want you know pay X amount of dollars and watch this. I'm in. I'm definitely. I'm in. But I'd watch anything. So all right. So that out of the way, the other thing I want to talk to you about is McGregor's opponent falls through. What yes. happens? Okay, so uh, Conor McGregor has this thing that whenever apparently you sign a contract to fight him, something bad happens to you because he, he's literally had like five or six of his UFC opponents fall out at this point, but it's just kind of always what happens. Now, his up upcoming opponent, Rafael Dos Anjos, he hurts his foot. Now, it's a fracture of the foot. Probably take him two or three weeks to recover. Fight's in two weeks, so it's kind of like, ah, why bother? But it's important a to know. A fracture in a foot is a broken foot. If you fracture a bone, it's broken. Listen, I don't it's have... It's a thin yeah. break, but it's still a break. Like yeah. that, Especially in your foot, you couldn't move. Listen, I had a hairline fracture in my foot, and I, I couldn't walk. So, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and be like, guy should have fought. I, I can't say that. What I can say is Conor McGregor had a torn meniscus in his last fight, and he still fought. I've seen fighters on many of occasions still make it to the big dance. Now, yeah, but Rafael... When you're, but, but if you're someone who's not Conor McGregor, who's, is Conor McGregor the best fighter right now? Well, I'm not going to say yeah, but there's certainly an he's, argument. He's, he's one of them. The argument's so there. So if you're going to take on one of the best guys, you feel like you'd want to be at 100%. Putting yourself at a disadvantage going in to fight the best guy, probably not the savviest move. Yeah, but isn't it just weird that Carmen McGregor's supposed to fight Jose Aldo, and then a week later it's like, oh, I know, I hurt my rib. And then you're supposed to fight Rafael Sanchez, and then a week, a week out it's like, oh, well, I hurt my foot. Like, why is this a recurring theme? I don't know. And to that same point— Well, guys could be overtraining because they know they're going up against one of the best guys, and they're hurting themselves. Well, that's, well, that's, that's my theory. My theory is if I tell you, like, hey, hey Pat, do you want to fight next Wednesday? 
yeah, okay, sure. We show up next Wednesday. If I talk a whole lot of smack to you, then you're going to be like, I'm going to wake up early and go run five miles. And then I'm going to go home after work and I'm going to eat clean and I'm going to kick this guy. But because you're working out three times a day now. I'm hurting myself. You hurt yourself and you get there and you're exhausted and you're burnt out and your opponent has that advantage on you. So McGregor's may be able to get in people's heads. But if you want a greasy theory alert, remember a couple weeks ago the Cain Velasquez fell, the fight fell through. So Velasquez pulls out of the fight saying he, he, he injured his back. Fabricio Verdum says, okay, you hurt your back, you're out. They replace Kane, and then Fabricio goes, oh, well, you know something? I actually hurt my foot. Rafael Dos Anjos goes, ah, I can't fight you. I hurt my foot. they both training partners at the same gym with the same coach. So is it possible that they do have injuries, and their coach is like, if you're not 100%, you don't fight. I want my guys at 90 or 100%. Whereas most fighters will tell you, you enter pretty much every fight 80%. Because if you train hard, there's no way you're going in there without a bum knee or a bum shoulder. But as soon as the fight, as soon as that cage door locks, adrenaline starts pumping through your veins, you don't notice anything until afterwards, for the most part. So who's his new opponent then? Uh, his new opponent's going to be Nate Diaz. Nick Diaz's younger brother. He, uh, He's going to get waxed? He's going to get waxed. I, I saw the opening line was like minus 275. And I, again, people minus 275. You need to bet that now if that's the case. Oh, I, I can go check what it is like at this moment. That's, I'm assuming it's going to get to six or seven. I, well, that's why I saw people predicting like, what do you think the line on the fight's going to be? They were like minus 600, minus 700. That Isn't this guy good. bigger though? Or is he moving up another weight class? Oh my God. So get this Conor McGregor is the best 145 pound fighter on the planet. He's fighting at 175? 165. 165. Yeah, but you got the best 145 pound fighter fighting. A contender at 155 at a weight class of 165. <laughs> so, and, and McGregor made a comment like, "Let's just go to 170." Like, whatever. I don't, I don't really care about the five pounds. He's talked about going to 170 in the past. And I always say style make fights. And Nate Diaz is very flat-footed. He's very open. He's very hittable. He's not exactly the fastest guy, but he pressures you and he talks a lot of smack. He gets in your head. McGregor talks more amounts of smack. You're not going to get in his head. He's so much faster. So much more precise. Minus 350 is the line now. So at, least, at least from Bodog and Bobada, minus 350. For sure. So it's gone 275 to 350, 350 so it's just to gonna... 400, 4 to 450. Like it'll just it'll just keep going. And is this Diaz guy like is, he has? He's obviously not gonna have a full camp. Is he like short notice? Like has he been training at least? He fights at 155 pounds. So he has he's... to gain weight. No, 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 no. He he's got two weeks out, right? So he fights at 155. So normally he cuts the weight. And so he's like 180 down. right now. Well, he told them he's like, I can't make 155 <laughs> on two weeks. So they were like, Well, how about 165? He was like. Okay, but I was on Twitter last night, and this guy that's close to him was saying like, Nate Nate's not gonna Nate's not going to the gym unless the dollars are there, and he's not making the weight. Da 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 da. And then all of a sudden, it, this last night, it gets announced like, Nate's in, and the weight's not an issue. So it's like, okay, the dollars got paid, <laughs> which is great for him, man. Good for him. He's he just gonna get it. turfed in this fight. He can take one hell of a punch. So I think he can maybe make it to like the seven or eight minute mark, and then I think he's going down. Is it gonna be five rounds? It's not going to go five rounds, but it'll be scheduled for five rounds. How, what, what would be your early prediction right now? Obviously, we're not there. But early prediction right now, how long does this last? Two rounds, because McGregor's going to knock Two him out. Two full rounds, or he gets knocked out in the second round? If I'm playing safe third round, my gut's telling me second round. And I'm not saying, it's not a, you know how I was talking earlier, I was like, Tom Brady's going to beat this guy 100%. Yeah, it's not I mean, like that. No, no, because Nate Diaz is a black belt on the ground. A bona fide CZ Gracie black belt, good submissions, good ground game. If for whatever reason the fight hits the ground, he's much better on the ground. It's just, ah, uh, will the fight hit the ground? Well, that's the big question. I don't think so, but Nate Diaz could win. So if he wins, he subs him within two. If McGregor wins, he knocks him within two. Either way, this ain't going five. Take the under. Cody Saftik. Follow him on Twitter, at CJ Saftik, and remember to check out the Bookie Beatdown on the Fight Network and Bookie Beatdown Podomatic and iTunes feed, along with a Mel Kuyper of reality TV breakdowns, and apparently UFC too. Paul Shaughnessy, he's on there. It's hot fire, man. He's telling me on, he's, he's telling me the other day, he's like, oh, my, my bachelor picks. He's like, his bachelor picks are off the charts. He's like, <laughs> he has the final four people. <laughs> he goes, he goes, he goes, he goes, there's only four girls left on the show, and I got all four. Oh, he's being a real like, big oh, man about God. it too. He's, oh, no one knows bachelor better than me. <laughs> Listen, arguably, no one does. I don't I don't watch the show because I don't, I didn't. I forgot to get my team on the deadline. It just <laughs> killed me. Um, you need to have the team or you're not paying attention. Uh, Paul is an excellent judge of character. He, he might look at the UFC line and he can't tell you who's going to win the fight, but he can tell you the one guy's a shitty human being. <laughs> like He's great with personality trait. All right. That's going to do it. I'm Pat Mayo. You can follow me on Twitter at the PME. And remember, subscribe to the Pat Mayo Hour on YouTube and iTunes and Roku and Xbox and anywhere. Multimedia is present. Pat Mayo will be there too. I'm Pat Mayo, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>